Hey, College Heights family, it's Cy Huffer here, and I'm the lead minister at College Heights Christian Church. And however you're watching, however you're engaging today, we are thrilled that you are joining with us in our online service. Uh, it's, I have one big announcement for you today, and it's all about next week, the time where we get to resume our in-person gatherings. That will begin next week, June 14th. We're going to have three services that day at 10 a.m., 1 p.m., and 6 p.m. Now, in order for us to follow all of the requirements and recommendations that the city of Joplin is asking us to do and calling us to do, we are needing everyone to register yourself, your family, your friends, whoever's coming with you to one of those three services. That registration will open 48 hours before our services this next week, and you'll be able to go to chjoplin.org, and you'll be able to register there. We will also be uh, sending an email blast out to you this week on email, all the details. We'll have social media, all the details, helping you know how you can register for one of our three services and what it looks like to engage in that way. Speaking of engagement, we are having a wonderful service to, for you today. We're so excited to be engaged and partnering with you and worshiping with you. But the way in which to do that is to move beyond just viewing to engagement. And the way in which we do that, one of the primary ways, is through our chat. So if you're watching this service online on your TV, make sure you pull out like, your mobile device and go to our app or to the, our website, chjoplin.org, and you can engage the service uh, chat, saying hi to each other, uh, maybe uh, responding to questions being asked by one of our moderators, and just maybe even just hitting that heart button uh, when, when something moves you and hits you in some form or fashion. It's kind of like a, a visual amen, even though we can't hear each other saying amen. And so, hey, make sure you engage through our chat. Also, make sure you share this service through your social media platforms by hitting that link that says share the service um, in the chat that's there. Hit that. There's people around you that are close to you but far from God that need the hope of Jesus today. And so hit that, share that service, invite other people to come watch and engage the service with you online through Facebook or whatever social media platform that you are on. Um, last thing I just want to remind you is you can always at any point request for prayer by hitting that live prayer button and one of our ministers will love to respond to you through a chat right now in person and pray with you. You can also text the word talk at any time beyond one of our broadcast times, if you're watching the service later in the day or when there's not a live broadcast service happening, you can text the word TALK to 417-281-3974, and one of our ministers will follow up with you within 24 hours. Uh, before we jump into the rest of our service, I do want to just pause and acknowledge that this last week's been a hard week for us in our country. Um, with all kinds of racial tensions and, the, and having kind of the veil pulled back to show that, man, racism is still very evident and embedded into our society. Uh, and all the, the riots that have happened since then, there, there's a, just a lot of tension going on. And this last Thursday night, we had a prayer service as a starting point to ask the Lord to show us how we can engage breaking down all the dividing walls of, walls of hostility in our culture and in our world. And kind of to acknowledge the fact that, man, that was a great night. If you were a part of that, you can still engage that on one of our platforms on YouTube or Facebook or whatever. But that was a starting point. We always start, our first response is always prayer, but that doesn't mean that's the last thing that we do. And, and I just want to take a moment and just acknowledge and spend some time here in our service, continuing to pray, continuing to ask the Lord, what is our role as we seek to bring about heaven on earth? So I'm going to invite um, Nathan Morris, our uh, high school minister up here, and just kind of have him kind of lead us through prayer today. Pain and sorrow, and anger, and deep words that I cannot express. These are the feelings and the reactions of the black community right now. And I hope that if you are a follower of Christ, that they're your reactions too. And as we're in this time of, of racial tension, of, of rampant racism, where people are losing their lives, we call out to God. We asked him to show us his mighty hand of justice. And while we wait, all we can do is lament. We lament George Floyd, his life that was destroyed. We lament Trayvon Martin and Eric Garner and Freddie Gray, 
all black men whose lives were lost before their time. We lament Breonna Taylor, whose precious life was snuffed out in a careless spray of gunfire. And we lament Ahmed Arbery going for a jog when he lost his life at the hands of systemic injustice and racism. And these are just some of the most well-known names. We also lament our black brothers and sisters who lost their lives, whose names we don't know, whose stories we don't know. We lament a fallen world where people can still lose their lives in such a manner. And we lament a state of a nation where a large swath of the people would rather say people are overreacting or making it up than to admit that racism is still alive and well. We lament this. And as we do, we cry out to God, please show your hand. How long, O Lord? How long will injustice reign in this world? How long will people be silent in the face of the evils of racism and hatred? How long will people be looked at as less than because of the color of their skin? How long until those steeped in power and privilege understand those who aren't? How long until racism is treated as something long gone? How long will you be silent, oh God? How long will, until injustice doesn't have to be trending on social media for people to care? How long until a careless spray of fire isn't the first response? How long will people be able to ignore the truth? Why are you silent, oh God? Can you not see your sons and daughters are being persecuted? Can you not see that your children are dying at the hands of injustice? We will wait for you, O God. We will lift our eyes to the hill where our help comes from. We will wait for you, O God.
arms are open wide Forgiveness is bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ In the crush in the pressing, you are making new art. In the soul, I now surrender. You are breaking new ground. So I yield to you and to your careful hand. And I trust you, I don't need to understand Make me a vessel Make me an offering Make me whatever you want me to be I came here with nothing But all you have given me Jesus, bring new wine out of me in the crushing in the pressing you are making new are in the soul I now surrender you are breaking new ground I know it by breaking this new ground So make me a vessel Make me an offering Make me whatever You want me to be I came here with nothing But all you have given me Jesus bring you out Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Cause where there is new wine, there is new power, and there is new freedom, and the kingdom is here. Lay down my old flames to carry your new fire. our prayer today make me a vessel make me an offering make me whatever you want me to be I came here with nothing but all you have given me Jesus bring new wine Spring the water out of me one more time. Jesus, bring the water out of me. I still remember the very first email that was ever forwarded to me by my boss, Logan Greer. It was an email from a company that distributes big yard games. So like Nine Square and Cornhole, the lifeblood of youth ministry. And I remember that this email totally mortified me. And it was not because they were charging a crazy amount for an inflatable T-Rex suit. Instead, it was because Logan Greer himself had put in the body of the text, is there anything you think we should get? And I was like, oh, okay. It's all becoming very real to me now. All of a sudden, the expectation was that I was to be the expert on how the youth ministry was run. 
I was to be the expert on what we did, how we did it, and how we spent our money. It was a lot of pressure. So I ended up just to be safe, getting a few Frisbees. I think that they're probably lost on a roof somewhere, never to be played with again. But whenever I think back to that email, especially in the context of the church, it actually saddens my heart quite a bit because I see such a stark contrast. You see, a long time ago, this world stopped caring about what the church says is right or wrong. We live in a world where somehow the all-consuming gospel of Jesus's love for everyone has been reduced down to a spirit of bigotry and exclusion. And we live in a world where a website that makes its living promoting and distributing pornographic material and openly partnering with human trafficking can post something about black lives mattering. And the world looks at that and gives it more credit than when the church says the exact same thing. No, 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 no. That is our lane and we need to stay in it. I'm not saying that you have to be an expert on the complexities of racism. I'm not saying that you have to be an expert on immigration laws or socioeconomic crisis. But if you are a follower of Christ, then we are absolutely called to be the experts on how to show love in this world. And if it is not us, somebody else who does not understand love is going to take that spot. That is our lane and we need to stay in it. And I'm not talking about the kind of love where you awkwardly toss a crumpled 20 to a homeless person on the side of the street because it's weird and they're making eye contact. I'm not talking about the kind of love where you post Black Lives Matter. Okay, I solved the issue on your social media. I'm talking about the kind of love that bleeds. I'm talking about the kind of love that Jesus showed to us whenever he ditched the glorious throne room of heaven, wrapped himself in the very flesh that he made. He lived a perfect life. He died in our place for our sins and then rose again to bring us new life with God. That's the kind of love that the church should be known for. That's the kind of love that we're remembering as we take communion. And before we do that, I have one more thing to say. If you're somebody who feels like racism is not an issue in this country or this world, if you're somebody who feels like people of color need to lighten up and stop taking everything so seriously, if you're somebody who essentially doesn't care, I've got three things. Number one, brother or sister, I love you, I do. Number two, yo, you cannot call yourself a follower of Christ if you don't care about the things that Christ cared about and he cared enough to die for it, he bled for it. Number three, before you consume that bro the bread and the juice or whatever it is that you have today, I want you to take a hard look at it and remember what it represents before you decide to take it with us. Let's take some time to reflect. Song in itself, 
the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and broke it. He said, take and eat. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and after giving thanks, said, drink, this is my blood of the new covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. Amen. Okay, hey, I wanna let you guys know, thank you all so much. I'm super excited about how generous everybody has been here at College Heights. Um, Normally, we're able to have a vast kingdom influence with the money that you guys give. We've also been uh, doing something recently called the Dollar Club. If you don't know about this, check it out, okay? We're asking each of you to give $1 per person that is viewing this service. Okay, so in your family, we count our cats sometimes. I don't want to, but my wife does, all right? So we give five extra bucks every week, and the church is going to take that money. They're going to help people throughout the community, okay? So we got people that are impacted by COVID. We got people that just are generally struggling, and we've been able to make a huge kingdom impact. Praise God. Check out this video on how to give. At College Heights, we wanted to make sure that giving online is extremely secure and very simple. So if you'd like to donate, go to chjoplin.org donate, or at the top of our webpage, you can click donate. From there, we'll redirect you to our secure online giving platform. Enter how much your gift is, and if this is a one-time gift, thank you so much for giving. 
This website also allows you to set up reoccurring gifts, which will allow you to choose how often per month and which day of the week your donation is given. Then enter your first and your last name and your email so that a receipt can be sent to you as soon as your gift is submitted. You'll note that you're able to give through a card or by routing your bank account directly. If you have an Apple device, you can set up Apple Pay as well. One thing that we really like about this site is that you're able to cover fees or see at least what it costs to do this. So routing through your bank costs a lot less than paying with a card, making sure that every dollar given does a lot more ministry. Click give and you'll be sent a receipt thanking you for your gift. But one great thing is you're also able to create a login on Tithely, which will allow you to monitor your giving throughout the year. At College Heights, we pray that every dollar given does more ministry than we could ever imagine. During times of disruption in our lives, even when we can't see it or are asleep to it, we believe God is working. So today I am burdened by grief when it comes to this fallen world. I don't know who you are, don't know where you are at today, where you're watching this service, if it's in the morning, if it's with the afternoon, with your kids or taking a nap or at night by yourself in a dorm room or an apartment. But this service was filmed on June 7th, 2020, and the previous week pulled back the veil to reveal a world that was hurting, angry, divided, and in pain. And I personally, I am burdened and overwhelmed. I'm burdened by the murders of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor. I'm burdened by our brothers and sisters in Christ who are expressing their pain and their hurt over years of hate crimes and injustices and oppression against them. And it's really hard for me to understand because I've not experienced those things in my life. And I've been thinking a lot about this as I've made phone call after phone call to just have conversations with different brothers and sisters who are people of color that I know and are friends with and have known over the years and just asking them to help me understand. And I guess the one word I want to give to you today is, is, is trust. Even though this is not an experience I have had, it's upon me to trust those who have had it, to seek out and understand and to mourn with them as they mourn. I'm burdened by those who have lost their livelihoods, their property, even their lives because of riots. I'm burdened by my own ignorance over my life that I don't truly understand the plight of everyone that I come into contact with. And I'm guessing I'm not alone. I'm guessing, I'm wondering this, are you feeling what I'm feeling today? And there's so many emotions I see all over social media. We as a society, we're angry, embittered, scared, afraid, ashamed, tired, and doubtful. We are burdened and overwhelmed because we are surrounded by so much pain. I mean, what do you do when evil is all around you? What do you do when you just see darkness begin to envelop you? What do you do when suffering and pain and when hell literally is surrounding you like an army? What do you do? The psalmist David, he puts it like this in Psalm 57 verse 4. I am in the midst of of lions. I am forced to dwell among ravenous beasts, men whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Is this you? And do you feel overwhelmed by evil and injustice and pain and hate and division that you see in our world? Because I know I do. So what do you do? What, what can you do? What must you do. If you aren't a follower of Christ, I honestly don't know how you, how you navigate these moments and issues in our society without Jesus. I really don't. I don't, I don't know how you do it. 
Because as a Christ follower, my hope and my peace and my rest comes from the belief that Jesus is the way, he is the truth, he is the life, and that he is our chief shepherd guiding us through this hell on earth that we find ourselves living in. And so we as Christians, our response is to turn to Jesus and ask him to guide us. We turn to him in prayer. We turn to him in worship. We turn to him in community. And we turn to him to the Bible to see how he guided other people throughout the thousands of years that have gone before us, how he guided them through the hell and earth that they were living in. And we pull out of that and we say, okay, so what does that mean for us today? How does he guide us through this craziness now? So that's what we're going to do today. Because that's all we know to do to follow Jesus and to be changed by him and to get on mission with him. So before we jump into kind of this incredible story today, I want want to ask you to pray this prayer of surrender with me from the Psalm of David. It's chapter 57. Let's pray. Have mercy on me, my God. Have mercy on me. For in you I take refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster is past. I cry out to God most high, to God who vindicates me. He sends from heaven and saves me, rebuking those who hotly pursue me. God sends forth his love and his faithfulness. I am in the midst of lions. I am forced to dwell among ravenous beasts, men whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Amen. See, these words we just prayed, they're from the diary, the journal of a man named David. It's a song. And it was a prayer that he wrote when he had to flee from King Saul into a a cave to save save his life from a murderous, unjust king. You see, David had done no wrong. He'd only served the king, the King Saul, with, with excellence and faithfulness. But the problem was Saul was insecure by being king. Even though he was a foot taller than everyone else in the kingdom, when the lot fell to him to be king, he hid. He hid because he wasn't secure in who he was. He hid when Goliath, the tallest guy on the Philistine side, challenged Saul, the tallest guy on the Judah's side, to a match of one-on-one to the death. He hid. And it was in this moment that David, this little teenager, they called him Ruddy, he was a short guy, he was the runt of the family, He went out and faced down the giant, killed him, and became an overnight phenomenon. It was here that Saul began to hate everything that David did, everything about David. He tried to kill him three times with a spear. See, David would be playing music for him on his lyre that he would, almost like a little guitar, and would try to help kind of calm Saul down after a, a stressful, busy day as king. And multiple times as he was playing this music, Saul got so mad and angry and he hated David so much, he picked up a spear and he threw it at him. He tried to take a cheap shot at David. And good thing for us, Saul was a bad aim and he missed three different times. So Saul decided, listen, I can't kill David. Let me let the Philistine armies kill David by sending him out to battle after battle after battle. Yet David was victorious each and every time. So much so that the people sang these words. They sang, Saul has killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. Well, that didn't sit so well with the king. Finally, Saul had enough, and he said to his son in chapter 20, verse 31, as long as the son of Jesse, as long as David lives on this earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Now send someone to bring him to me, for he must die. So David ran away. And after one pit stop at a cave and in a wilderness and in a desert after another, David found himself in a cave called in Gedi. It was a wilderness place, and he was there with a group of misfits. And this is where our story picks up. First Samuel 24, 1 through 2, it says this, after Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 able young men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. See, David was in the wilderness. 
He was in the wilderness, a hunted man by the power of the state. When he penned those words, we prayed, I'm in the midst of lions. I'm forced to dwell among ravenous beasts, men whose teeth are sparrows, spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. See, I, I don't know who you are. I don't know where you come from. I don't know what your story is. I don't know what your present circumstances are. But I do know this, that you and me, that everyone on the face of this earth, that we will at one time or another experience a wilderness. Eugene Peterson says it this way, but there are times, no matter how thoroughly we are civilized, when we're plunged into the wilderness. Not a geographical wilderness, but what I'm going to call a circumstantial wilderness. Everything's going along fine. We've learned the language of the country, gotten a job, decorated the house, signed up for car payments, made out a schedule that imposes some order on the chaos of time, accepted responsibilities that define our significance, heard people speak our name, and determined that we're identifiable. And then suddenly, we're beside ourselves. We don't know what's going on within us or in another who is important to us. Feelings erupt in us that call into question what we've never questioned before. There's a radical change in our bodies or our emotions or our thinking or our friends or our job. And it comes down to this. Hear this. We're out of control. And we're in a wilderness. Can I get an oh yeah? Yeah. I mean, this last year, think about those words, being out of control in a wilderness. I imagine that every single one of us have felt that at one point or another. Uh, last, the, a couple nights ago, I was talking to Monica, my wife, and I said to her, can you believe that at the end of this month, we're going to be halfway through the year? And she just kind of started laughing and I started laughing because we just couldn't grasp the fact that we were six months into 2020. On the one hand, it has been so slow, day after day, week after week. But on the other, it feels like we've lost half the year. And it's just been stolen from us, taken away. It's because we've had our normal disrupted so fiercely that we've had to dwell in the wilderness with ourselves and God and his creation, and we've had to face so much. I love how Eugene Peterson kind of concludes his writing about the wilderness. He says this, when we're in the wilderness, we aren't in control. We have no assignment, no appointments to keep. Stay alert. Stay alive. That's it. Stay alert. Stay alive. That's all David was concerning himself with. Hunkered down the back of his cave with his criminal and bankrupted friends in the middle of the wilderness, staying alert of Saul and his army and trying everything he can to just stay alive. Behind the scenes, in the dark, where no one's looking. And then a figure enters the cave and David recognizes his silhouette. Check it out in verse three. He came to the sheep pens, this is Saul, Saul came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there. And Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. Can you picture the scene? Well, don't, because it's gross. <laughs> but seriously, picture, not don't picture, understand the vulnerable situation Saul found himself in. He was completely at risk. No weapon in hand, clothing or mood, in the middle of doing something else, not focused or prepared on defending himself at all. Here was the cause for life in the wilderness for David. Saul, his sworn enemy, given up to him on a silver platter. And look what his men say in verse 4. This is the day, this is the day, this is the moment the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. All it would take is one act of violence. All it would take was one sneak attack. All it would take was one word spoken to his men, go. And all this pain, all this hurt, 
all this anger and bitterness and life live in the wilderness, it would all just go away. Chuck Swindoll calls it the three-step process we go through when we enact revenge on others. It's injury, vulnerability, and depravity. First, there's injury, meaning one party hurts the other intentionally or unintentionally, and you're broken, you're disrespected, you're devalued, you're left in pain because of what they did. Then there's vulnerability. Not on Your part, the the offended party, but on the party who offended you, who oppressed you, who hurt you, they let their guards down. They find themselves in weakness. They find themselves in a place of vulnerability. And it's like you have now an opportunity to get back at them. Then comes depravity. It's out of your hate, out of your anger, you conjure up the worst possible thing that you can ethically do to hurt them in their weakness or maybe even unethically do. And you mix these three things together and it equals revenge. It's what we spew out of our mouths at our spouse. It's what we refuse to do for our co-workers to help them out when they are in a pinch. It's what we celebrate on the news when that group, that person, that entity is denied or destroyed or denounced. And it's what we all want to do to the oppressors to those who cause injustices in our society, to those who cause pain, who hate, who divide, who pillage and plunder, who are racist and devalue human life. So David begins to move. He slowly crawls towards Saul on his belly, masterfully avoiding any small scrape of a shoe or crunch of a rock. And he cuts off a piece of Saul's robe. And then he crawls back. You see, he made a choice, and his men couldn't believe it. So much so that he had to rebuke them about his choice. And Saul left that cave unharmed and unaware. I mean, what was David doing? Letting this lunatic go would only cause more harm than good, not just for himself, but for his men, for his family, for his brothers, and for the entire nation. Like, this is letting a Hitler walk free, a maniac who was hell-bent on killing David and destroying whatever got in his way. He had already killed a whole family of priests because they simply gave David some food. He was not stable. So why did David do this? Look at what David says to Saul after he lets him go. My Lord, the king, Why do you listen when men say David is bent on harming you? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. You were vulnerable. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lay my hand on my Lord. Because, you ready for this? Because he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, look at this piece of robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe but did not kill you. See that that there is nothing in my hand to indicate that I am guilty of any wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me. May the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hand will not touch you. He called him my Lord, King. He called him the Lord's anointed. You see, when David looked at Saul, he didn't see a lunatic. He didn't see a crazed killer. He saw a child of God, someone anointed by God, appointed by him to be over the kingdom for such a time as this. David didn't see Saul how everyone else did, but how God saw Saul. You see, this is the beginning of reconciliation. No matter what kind of reconciliation you're talking about, whether it be reconciliation with your spouse or your abusive parent or reconciliation between the different ethnicities in our society, this is how justice is done in God's way. We must see every human being the way God sees them, not for their mistakes and imperfections, but for their humanity. 
They are made in the image of God. Chuck Swindoll says in the military that he had fantastic commanding officers over him, but he also had just horrendous, excuse, horrific excuses of a gentleman over him also as commanding officers. And yet in the military, they taught you that you don't salute the person, but you salute the office. You don't salute the person, for but you salute the office that they contain. That's what David did. He didn't see the murderous, crazed, jealous, evil man. He saw the Lord's anointed, chosen by God, and made by him for such a time as this. That's why I will always be against using shaming language to describe a human being. Because the blood of Jesus washes away all of these false identities that our enemy Satan tries to accuse us with. He tries, Satan tries to replace your true identity with a false one. Yet through Jesus' death and resurrection, you are no longer a criminal, but created by the creator. You're no longer an adulterer, but adored by your heavenly father. And you are no longer a racist, but redeemed and renewed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now let me give you a couple of caveats to this. Do followers of Jesus, do they commit crimes? Yes. Do followers of Jesus, do they commit adultery? Yeah. And do followers of Jesus, do they think racist thoughts and do racist things? Absolutely yes. Because of Jesus' death and resurrection, your sin does not become your identity. That is the good news. That is the good news. But here's where this gets really, really tough. The beginning of unraveling all this mess we find ourselves in is seeing every person oppressed or oppressor made in the image of God. No matter what they've done or what's been done to them, no matter what political line, uh, left or right, that they find themselves in, no matter what color of skin they are, they had seen every person not the same, not colorblind. Not all sinners are the same, but they're all made by the same God. And they all contain the same office as bearers of the image of God. Friends, this is the starting point of reconciliation. Made in God's image, but broken by sin, yet working out their salvation with fear and trembling, finding victory in Jesus. Mary Johnson is a teacher's aide in Minneapolis. And several years ago, her son was shot at a party and was killed by a man who was 17 years old named O'Shea Israel. And O'Shea was convicted of murder and he was sentenced to 25 and a half years in prison. After 17 years, he was released and O'Shea moved in next door to Mary. You see, as a committed Christian, Mary sought out O'Shea in prison. She sought her son's killer out to find out if there was some way she could forgive him. They began to meet regularly while he was in prison, forming a strong friendship. When he got out, she introduced him to her landlord, and with her blessing, they invited him to live in the apartment complex right next door to Mary. In an interview on CNN, she said this, Unforgiveness is like cancer. It will eat you from the inside out. It's not about the other person. Me forgiving him does not diminish what he has done. Yes, he murdered my son. But the forgiveness is for me. It's for me. Today, O'Shea is working a steady job, going to college at night, and sings praise songs for prisons around the country, speaking about the power of forgiveness. Friends, this is the gospel. Mary chose to see O'Shea as a human full of dignity and value and worth, anointed by God with life, with God's image, instead of seeing the murderer of her son. And that's what O'Shea did to Mary. He was willing to meet with her, to not see her as a victim, but as a woman made in the image of God, who he could 
have a relationship with. It's the choice to be a gospel person, a Jesus person above everything else. Brant Hansen says it this way, war is not exceptional, peace is. Worry is not exceptional, trust is. Decay is not exceptional, restoration is. Anger is not exceptional, gratitude is. Selfishness is not exceptional, sacrifice is. Defensiveness is not exceptional, love is. And judgmentalism is not exceptional. But grace is. This is what Jesus calls you to. To love your enemy. To pray for those who are different than you. And to repay evil with good. To see every human oppressed and oppressor made in the image of God containing that office of bearing significant value and worth ginormous significant and worth so much worth so much value that the God of the universe the creator of the cosmos entered into his creation he lived his life and he got up on the cross and he died an excruciating death to pay the price for you for me, for them, for that entity, for that person that you feel like you just can't live with, that you're embittered towards, who has abused you, who you have oppressed. And he rose again so he could give us heaven even when we deserved hell because he saw us for what we truly bearers of the image of God. He can do that for you today. You can click that, click that live prayer button during one of our broadcast services and one of our ministers, one of our moderators will start a live chat with you right now about what Jesus can do for your life. If you're watching this service at a time where we're not broadcasting live, you can text the word TALK to 417-281-3974 and one of our ministers will follow up with you within 24 hours hours. We'd love to chat with you about this Jesus and about the grace he offers. Let me pray today. Lord, we are burdened by the brokenness of this world. We acknowledge and we stand by those who have been oppressed for those who have experienced injustice in this world. And we say, we see you the value and the dignity and, 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 the, and the worth that God attributes to you, that you are bearers of the image of God, that you are made children of God who he sacrificed everything for. And we mourn with you. Lord, we ask that you give us eyes to see the oppressors in the same way, in the same light, that we are all made by God, broken by sin, working out our salvation with fear and trembling, finding victory in Jesus. Lord, give us grace to be gracious to each other in this time. In your holy name, amen.
Judah conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy of
against all evil and all injustice. So we sing a little louder. We sing a little louder. We sing a little louder. joining us today online. And just one thing to remind, to remind you about, next week we will be both online and in person. And I just cannot wait to be with you all here in this room next week, June 14th. Reminder, we are gonna have three services that way, 10, one, and six. And I just, I know our church family, you guys are gonna be flexible. And I'm so grateful that you're gonna help register on our website um, 48 hours before to help us gather together in person. I know we all are itching to get together and we have some requirements that we gotta follow to be good citizens of our community. And so I know that you guys are gonna help us do that so that we can gather and worship Jesus um, in person the way we're all yearning to do next week. I'll see you then. If you um, wanna talk to someone, click that live prayer button during one of our broadcast services or text the word talk to 417-281-3974. One of our ministers will follow up with you. If you wanna learn more about the church and get connected, text the word welcome. To that same number and we want to get a gift into your hand an amazon gift card and get to know you a little bit and and help you understand a next step you can take with us as a church and if you want to just learn more about our church family by interacting with our church family text the word facebook to that same number and we'll invite you to a private facebook group where you can interact with people of our church online and just talk about all the different kinds of things that are going on in our world and our society and as christians it was great to have you all today may the lord bless you and keep you May his face shine upon you and give you peace. See you next week.